Hi folks, Doc here. As some of you are aware, life is kind of keeping me hopping right now. Things aren't uh, quite what they could be. And uh, they're going to get a lot worse before they get any better, so I'm going to apologize now. Um, videos are probably going to slow down for a little bit. Probably get a little bit simpler for a little bit. Some of the projects are going to have to go on hold for a little bit. And it's just one of those things, right? Life comes before toys and projects and goofing off and stuff. Um, in the meantime, uh, while things have been somewhat busy for me, um, I kind of hit a point last week where I said, you know what, I got to get out. So, you know, some of my Facebook friends are aware that I buggered off into the wilderness for about four days and generally had a good time reconnecting with nature and decompressing and all that mumbo jumbo stuff that basically suggests that I had to turn the brain off, turn the phone off, turn the internet off and turn life off for a bit. Anyhow. With what little wrenching time I have been doing, uh, and I have been doing a little bit, I came back recharged out of the bush, still need to shave, eh? And picked up the tools. Now the first thing I did involves Mule 2. I've been meaning to do this for a while. Mm, that's right, for the second mule in a row, I have used a motorcycle brake pedal as my gas pedal. There it is right there, give you a better view. And the thing that I like about using a motorcycle brake pedal is that they're stronger, they're designed to put up with a heavy foot and a heavy boot beating on it, uh, unlike perhaps the bicycle brake handle lever thingy which does work, I'm just not a big fan. So this pedal assembly came from a 1983 Honda Interceptor 750, I believe. Uh, the aluminum bracketry was a lot larger and extended into the rear foot rest and I just whipped out the old grinder and cut it down and uh, bolted it to the fender pan. Another thing I like about motorcycle brake pedals is that they tend to already have a return spring mechanism and you can see that right there. And that makes it so that when you lay off the pedal, it retracts and it's all good. So they're heavy duty, they usually have a spring built in already, so you don't have to think about that part. Now I always do tell people to use two return springs, one at the carburetor or governor end of things, which is always a good policy, but you want one at the pedal as well. And uh, that kind of spares a step for you. So underneath, if I can get underneath, you can see that I had to slot out part of the footboard. And I don't have anything particularly fancy going on there. I've just got a, uh, a cable clamp and uh, you know some odd bits and stuffs. And all I had to do here is I had to make a wee little bracket to extend onto the existing cable bracket because I wasn't getting enough throw. It wasn't pulling the cable far enough every time I pulled the pedal to give me the wide open throttle. So I extended the bracket for more leverage and connected the cable and attached the cable conduit in place and ran it up and around. And what I have under the hood is also nothing particularly fancy. Just pop this open for you. And just show you the governor end of things. Uh, all I did was use a piece, believe it or not, of the existing throttle cable. And uh, basically bent a loop in it and used a cable crimp and attached the cable to it. And then I just added a wee little return spring so that when you push the pedal, that's what it does. And that's all it has to be. Nothing particularly fancy at all, but uh, puts the control at your foot, which is where I wanted it. Now, the original mule, mule one. Let me just back this up for a second. That wide rear end. I got some three and a half inch wheel spacers in there right now to make it wider. I'm playing with the idea. I know what's going to happen. It's okay. You don't got to tell me that. It's all good. It's an experiment. But I'll get to that. As many of you are aware, a week or so ago, I put these 22 by 11 by 8 Kenda Scorpions on the front. Um, and I had to use those wheel spacers I was talking about. Let's see if I can get a zoom in here. I didn't make these spacers. Somebody else did. And I just kind of repurposed them. You can kind of see it in there. Anyways, uh, because of the size of the tires, you know, I, I, I couldn't steer. I had major clearance issues. Um, so I had to use the spacers for the purpose of, you know, just making it so I could steer around a corner. 
And uh, in the process of doing all that, uh, I had to cut the ends off the bumpers. Because um, as you may recall, they stuck out six or eight inches on each side and the lights were mounted outboard. And uh, because of the size of the tires, you know, they were interfering, causing problems. So I cut the bumperettes off and I moved the lights inboard. Now, one thing I made a note of, and I'm sure some of you did too on Facebook when I posted the picture with those big balloon tires on there, was that, uh, you know, sometimes you can foresee breakage. Sometimes it comes as a surprise and sometimes you say, hey, that's going to break. And I looked at the design limitations of the front end of this thing and it had done well so far with all the other modifications, but I looked at it and I said, hey, that's going to break. Well, guess what it did? Yep, that's right. Uh, not long after I got the whole thing together and I got the steering stops in and everything's all hunky-dory and fine and good and doing what it's doing, I went for a romp and, uh, you know, I was five minutes into it and, well, you picked a fine time to leave me loose wheel. The boat trailer spindle had broken off just past the weld of the original spindle where I tacked it on, tacked it on where I welded it on in the first place uh, so that I could use these bolt-on posi lube trailer hubs and you know for anybody that hasn't had a good close look at this whole schmear uh, that's what I did is I used boat trailer hubs and uh, stub spindles uh, so that I could use bolt-on wheels in a common four-on-four -four pattern so that you know solves your problem of being able to get you know eight inch rim sized tires on the front of one of these things and it completely opens up the door for a whole plethora of available rim sizes so the tires that I had on here were four by eight trailer wheels and uh, these ones are seven inch wide. Actually, if I zoom right in there, you might just be able to see the DOT approval and the size marked on there. So with the breakage, the expected breakage, I knew that I was gonna have to do what I did today. And what I did today is I fabricated an entire new super beefy to hell with you ain't never going to break it front axle for this thing. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one wheel off to give you a better look at absolutely everything that's going now on. You notice as I'm lifting it that uh, this axle does not pivot. I decided it just wasn't worth my effort to allow it to pivot. <coughs> so it's bracketed in solid. I get plenty of traction out of the rear end. I'm not worried about the front end articulation. I'm going to take off the side with the steering arm to give you the best look at what's going on here. Okay, so here's your up close and personal look at the new axle and everything involved. So first off, these are the trailer hubs. And of course they've got high speed, you know, DOT rated highway grade bearings. Um, they're tapered roller bearings so I can adjust the slack out of them. Uh, they're gonna live a good long life and not have any problems there. The axle stubs themselves are, I think they're one inch diameter, they're pretty thick. Um, and then they've got these caps here and if you take the cap off there's a zerk fitting inside and when you apply grease there's a channel inside the spindle that distributes it straight to the bearings. Uh, very convenient. The axle tube is a piece of two inch square hollow and uh, it's 3 16 wall. It's very thick, it's very heavy, it's very not going to break anytime soon. So I tack welded it to the frame and then I made some brackets out of two inch angle iron and burnt them in. That axle is not going anywhere. Now you can see some of my welds are not entirely pretty. I was having a little difficulty with my machine today and I was in a hell of a hurry because I got a million things to do right now and just not enough time to do it. So I didn't bother getting as clean and pretty as I could have. I just basically put it together. So <clears throat> these spindle brackets here came from an old go-kart of mine. Uh, they were hand fabricated and they're actually kind of reversed to the way they used to be. And the way they used to be is where I've got the spindle welded on was actually where the go-kart axle came from. And over here was the spindle and the wheel was over here. 
The original spindles are actually inside this tube. It just it wasn't worth cutting them off. It didn't make sense. Why cut them off? But they were 5 8 and they weren't stout enough to do what I wanted to do. So I cut it off at the axle, inverted it, jammed it in there, and welded it. Uh, this is after um, I did some measuring and I gave myself about 8 degrees of uh, caster angle. So if this tube is directly square to the frame, or to the road more accurately, this is actually inclined about 8 degrees off the vertical, if this is your vertical plane. Uh, so then what I did from there is for this side, I of course had to fabricate a steering arm. Uh, so I did, I welded a tab on here with a hole in it, and then I gusseted it in so it's nice and seriously strong, and this is all 3 16 inch thick steel plate. Beefy as all hell. Uh, the kingpin is a 5 8 bolt, uh, not even a half inch, it's 5 8 That's not going anywhere. Uh, the original steering arms off the go-kart, uh, I cut off and reused and then gusseted with some more 3 16 steel plates, so that's not going anywhere. Okay, so the tie rod, I fabricated a new tie rod and you can see it's beefy as all hell. That's about a one inch outside diameter and it's a stainless steel pipe because I had it. Uh, and then I just reused my original heim joints. Let's see if I can get the camera underneath so you can get a better look at the heim joints. There we go, decent enough heim joints. There's uh, not exactly a lot of slop in this steering. It's, uh, it's pretty good. Now the drag link, I had to cut off the original drag link uh, because of this muffler brace for one thing amongst other things. And I did some bending and I scabbed in a hunk of pipe and I bent the pipe and rearranged everything and then I wound up using my one of my last two remaining heim joints, which was uh, metric, unfortunately, which left me running around looking for a metric bolt, and all I did was, you know, welded the bolt to this piece of pipe. Um, but metric or not, it uh, does the job. but she steers, I can't ask for much more than that. So I did the alignment on it, and uh, you know, when the tires are straight, they're reasonably straight, and as you can see by the overhead view, um, with this steering arm being angled inwards, I've got my Ackerman angles, and they're pretty close to being accurate, and it does steer well. The only thing that I need to do is I need to perform a length adjustment, and I'll see if I have, I'll see if I have enough adjustment in this heim joint here. I might not, I might have to shorten this by about a quarter of an inch. The only difficulty I have right now is it'll steer full stop left but not quite full stop right and that's it's just a throw adjustment right it's how far this thing goes back and forth when you steer so I just have to alter the length just a wee little bit. But I had her for a test run and the front end feels well incredibly you know stable and beefy as you would imagine and uh, <clears throat> for what it is and the balloon tires and all it does steer pretty well and uh, yeah, I added some weight to her, there's no doubt. She's pretty heavy duty and she's pretty heavy. This axle, I am not going to break. So yeah, back to the rear axle equation. Um, I ended up making this axle, the front axle, substantially wider than the factory original so that I would have enough steering clearance for the tires, and I do now. Um, however, of course, that left me with an exceptionally wide front end and a fairly narrow rear end. I mean, the way I worked the rear end on this thing, it was wider than stock, but it wasn't wide enough. And I always thought that kind of looked silly when you've got a really wide front end and a skinny rear end. And it's not, you know, quite really a three-wheeler, but looks kind of goofy. So I've temporarily got those spacers in there. And, uh, well, I know if I keep going with that, I'm going to break something, which is fine. Um, breaking things merely means that, you know, you're finding all the weak links in your chain and dealing with them. So, <clears throat> just as I broke the front end, and I knew I was going to break the front end, and, you know, from the word go, I had planned to build a new front end that's, you know, beefier and capable of handling the abuse, uh, I'm going to wind up doing something in the rear end that is beefy enough to handle the abuse. If you hadn't noticed, the new axle is not sitting in the old axle pocket. Um, it's forward, and I moved it forward for a couple of reasons. 
Um, one reason is, is it extended my wheelbase another two and a half inches, which is going to add some stability. Um, this two inch square tube won't fit in that pocket. I do have some inch and a half square and I briefly thought about, you know, using the inch and a half instead of the two inch and sticking it in that pocket. But because these spindles don't raise the way J spindles do on a factory setup, I would have lost some height. <clears throat> and I'm trying to keep this thing, you know, sitting reasonably, you know, decently level. And uh, it just worked out better to locate the axle forward and use the two inch square, stronger, blah, better location, better ride height, etc. So, in the limited amount of wrenching time that I have had, that's what I've been up to. You've got to like bolt on hubs, don't you? No screwing around with, you know, C clips and stuff that's going to fail and. and beat them out of place and crappy bearings and this uh, setup will live through Armageddon. Fourteenth return of bills above and but the only thing that's gonna survive is cockroaches and this for an end. So once again Thanks for tuning in to Sprockets Garage on YouTube, and uh, be sure to visit Sulphur City Design to feed your adhesive addiction, and uh, I'll see you on the forums, and don't forget about the new Facebook group that I've created, Sprockets Garage on Facebook. Pretty easy to find, anybody's welcome to join, free to join, we talk about all kinds of stuff, not just limited to lawn tractors. Till next time, take care of yourself.